Hello, everybody. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party and the Socialist Party candidate for president in 2020. And this podcast, Green Socialist Notes, is about continuing to educate and advocate for the eco-socialist program that my running mate, Angela Walker, and I ran on in 2020. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, This genocide in Gaza continues. And now we're getting more evidence that Israel's real plan is to expel all the Palestinians from Gaza. It's just genocide. And of course, Egypt and the other Arab countries don't want the uh, refugees. Uh, It's a a real problem. And, uh, you know, one of the things that came out this week, uh, I think uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov must have been drunk when he did this interview with Russian state media this week, because he said in that interview, he equated the Russians' war on Ukraine with Israel's war on Gaza. And uh, that's the truth, unlike Biden, who doesn't get that right. Um, So we'll put the link in there. It was in RT, their state media. Um, You know, Lavrov had his excuses. He said they're both fighting Nazis, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, you know, this is a settler colonial occupation of Ukraine by Russia, just like Israel's settler colonial occupation of Palestine. And uh, it's just funny that that Lavrov blurted that out. Um, you know, we can all see the carnage right there on TV or on the social media in Gaza. You know, they're, they're, they're bombing civilian places. The casualties are massive. Uh, and then the failure to let you know humanitarian aid in food fuel water medicine uh there was one uh public health analyst who said a quarter of ghana's a gaza's people could die from disease if this isn't corrected soon and uh but we should also not lose sight of, of the carnage going on in in ukraine Thursday night, Russia launched 158 missiles and drones at cities all across Ukraine. It was the largest bombing assault since the full-scale invasion began two years ago. And Ukrainian air defense systems were able to strike down 114 of those missiles and drones, but 44 still hit their targets, which were civilian energy infrastructure, residential blocks, shopping malls, a maternity hospital. None of them uh, military targets making all these bombings war crimes. And, you know, the carnage is massive. I mean, we, the Ukrainians believe that as many as 25,000 uh, Ukrainians were killed in Mariupol alone in the first 12 weeks of Russia's invasion, which is more than the uh, Gaza Health Ministry says has been killed in Gaza to this point. I'm not saying one is worse than the other. There's probably more people than the health ministry in Gaza has been able to identify who are buried under the rubble. Uh, But, you know, the point is they are both uh, particularly brutal and cruel invasions. And, you know, I'm saying what Russia is doing in Ukraine is genocidal. They forcibly remove Ukrainians from their communities and occupied areas and resettled many of them in Russia. The estimates range between two and five million people. That's a war crime. Russia's Children's Commissioner, Maria Lova Belova, claims that they've taken 700,000 Ukrainian children uh, and, and to raise them as patriotic Russians to you know, re-educate them. Uh, she may be bragging. The Ukrainian authorities have been able to identify just under 20,000 of these children by name. And of course, they're demanding their return to Ukraine, but only a few hundred have been able to come back because their parents have been able to do a circuitous route to Russia with the with the papers and uh, been able to bring them back. By circuitous, I mean they go through Poland and Belarus and into Russia, find their children, some as far away as Siberia, and then bring them back by the by the same route. Um, you know, the this child. Uh, Kidnapping is why the International Criminal Court has issued a warrant for the arrest of Maria Lova Belova, as well as one for her boss, Vladimir Putin. Um, And the the Russians are not only uh, 
removing Ukrainians from these occupied territories. They're replacing them with Russian settlers. And that's a continuation of the Russian and then the Soviet Empire's cruel policies of mass deportations, colonization, and Russification. And for those Ukrainians who remain in the occupied territories, we have well-documented reports from groups like Human Rights Watch uh, that show that these people are subject to so-called filtration, where those who are still considered loyal to Ukraine are subject to detention for interrogation and often torture, sexual violence, disappearance, and summary execution. And the political indoctrination and militarization of youth in the occupied territories or those taken to Russia uh, are key characteristics of the Russian occupation. And boys who turn 18 are drafted into the Russian army to go fight their own country. And then in the public schools, they expunge Ukrainian history, tell Ukrainian children that their leaders are evil Nazis and denigrate the Ukrainian language as a peasant dialect that bastardizes Russian and needs to be replaced with proper Russian. So in short, this Russian settler colonialism is intent on a genocidal elimination of the Ukrainians as a nationality in their own lands, which is just what Israeli settler colonialism is intent on doing, the genocidal elimination of Palestines as a nationality in their own lands. And in Israel, they'll let the Palestinians stay if they accept uh, domination by the Israeli government. Um, so, you know, Lavrov, like, unlike Biden, got that equation right in that interview. But as consistent anti-imperialists and advocates of human rights, we should support both the Ukrainian and Palestinian resistance to Russian and Israeli settler colonialism and genocide. And so right now we got to stay out on the streets demanding a ceasefire in uh, Gaza. Uh, that is gaining traction. Uh, you have establishment uh, foreign policy people like David Ignatius of the Washington Post and uh, uh, what's his first name? Haas, who was president of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, saying as much that, you know, the U.S. has to get tougher with Israel to stop this, this uh, indiscriminate bombing and uh, get to a ceasefire. But of course, the ceasefire we want should just be the first step. It should be followed up immediately with the aid that people need to survive, and then right into a political process that leads toward a political solution to this problem. And, uh, you know, there's some demonstrations coming up in the next couple of weeks that people that are national, that people can go to, there'll be regional, uh, you know, demonstrations at the same time. And you know, in many of our communities, these things are going on all the time, and we all need to be out at these. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. You know, last week I talked about immigration and, and ridiculed the Republicans for their xenophobic fear mongering and racist scapegoating of immigrants. And I ridiculed the Democrats as well for succumbing to the Republican narrative that we're being invaded by immigrants instead of fighting that narrative and making fun of the Republicans as scaremongering chicken littles, which is what they are. And I said, you know, we should advocate open borders where people are free to come and go across borders, like in the European Union or the Caribbean community or the Central American Four or a dozen other open border zones around the world. Um, and what I just want to say today is, you know, maybe another way we should talk about this is we should legalize immigration. We want to legalize immigrants by giving them documents, who are those who are already here, the undocumented. Uh, we should just generalize it and say legalize immigration. That might be a more acceptable slogan than open borders. Um, and, you know, we did this. Immigration was legal really until uh, so there was some restrictions in the late 1800s. There were racist restrictions against Chinese and then Japanese. And then in 1924 was the Racist Immigration Act that limited immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, Mexico and Latin America, and of course, East Asia. And that didn't get repealed until the mid 60s. Um, but we've still had uh, limits on, on immigration quotas. Most people that want to come here just have no hope of coming legally because the quotas are so low. Um, so I would also point out that, you know, these people are 
freaking out over immigration like we're going to be overrun. But if if people were free to come and go, there'd probably be less people who would stay because a lot of immigrants want to come here. They want to get a job and then support their families back home. And with immigration being so difficult, they feel compelled to, to come and stay and bring their families with them. Uh, but if they're free to come and go, there might be uh, fewer permanent uh, uh, people staying here as immigrants. Um, the other thing, I, I heard a diplomat, a Mexican diplomat saying, yeah, the U.S. can, can block the border. We need the labor. Uh, they have some, you know, labor shortages, like in Monterey, where this guy was from. And, you know, a lot of these people, you mentioned Haitians in particular, are staying and working and becoming residents of Mexico. Um, and as I pointed out last week, you know, we have labor shortages. And, and when I, I talked about this, too, the Eco-Social Green New Deal budget that we did, the bottleneck was labor. You know, we have the technology, we can raise the money, but do we have enough people to do all the construction and manufacturing work that would be involved in a rapid transition to 100% clean energy and real zero greenhouse gas emissions? And we don't. And studies that have tried to, you know, scheme this out going back to the 90s, the guy Ross Gelspan, who was a editor of the Boston Globe and, and did wrote some books on climate change. He got some Harvard and MIT experts together to, to develop a scenario. And they said, you know, the, 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 the bottleneck in getting this done on a rapid timescale is labor. So uh, what I'm saying is immigration is not, nothing to be afraid of. And we should make fun of the Republicans who are a bunch of chicken littles running around like the sky is falling. It's not that big a problem. We just need to and, there, and as this Mexican diplomat pointed out, this is a worldwide problem. It's going to get worse with climate change. You know, he mentioned all the Bangladeshis going to uh, Indonesia and all the people fleeing wars in the Middle East uh, going to Europe. And, uh, you know, we, we have people that are stuck on borders, you know, from Belarus to Greece, um, trying to get to a place where they can be safe and provide for themselves because where they came from, Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries, uh, that's not possible. So this is going to be an ongoing issue, and I think it's an issue the Green Party should have a, a you know, a humane and, and progressive position on. And, you know, I think maybe the way we should phrase it is, you know, legalize immigration. And then the other thing going on, I mentioned climate change, is you know, what the U.S. is doing is simply unacceptable. I mean, they manifest that again at the most recent COP28 in Doha. Um, the U.S. is the world's largest producer and exporter of oil and gas, and it has it plans to expand oil and gas drilling uh, through 2030, more than any other country in the world. And the Democrats claim to be the party that's aware of climate change, whereas the Republicans say it's not a problem. So the problem is not technical, it's political. Um, Biden, as I've mentioned many times, as many people have said, has approved more oil and gas drilling on public lands than Trump did over the, you know, both of them over their first three years in office. And Biden promised when he ran for election that he would stop that. And then the Inflation Reduction Act is their big climate bill. You know, I call it bill back badly. The investment is token, a level far below what's needed to get to 100% clean energy and real zero emissions in a decade. My green, Eco-Socialist Green New Deal budget estimated that it would take $27.5 trillion over 10 years. The Inflation Reduction Act spends $360 billion, not trillion, or just 0.5% of what our budget estimated. And missing in this Inflation Reduction Act are mandates and regulations for carbon reduction, Missing is the planning and coordination of the complicated transition, which is why we need an eco socialist Green New Deal with public ownership in key industries in energy, transportation, and manufacturing so we can actually plan and carry out and implement this transition. What the Inflation Reduction Act does provide is investment incentives, tax breaks and credits and grants and subsidies to the corporations that got us into this mess. It leaves these corporations in charge, the same energy, transportation, and manufacturing corporations that built and still profit from the fossil fueled industrial system. 
So with no mandates and coordination, the Inflation Reduction Act relies on the separate decisions of 100 cor corporations who are looking out for their bottom line. And though those incentives you know, may not look good on their bottom line, we've seen that with offshore wind. Because of the recent high interest rates, the incentives aren't enough, so they're not building it. So that's why we need public enterprise and planning. Uh, so for one, we can uh, put make the investments now, which will pay off as people pay for electricity or the product that a particular industry provides, uh, rather than it being immediately profitable to these corporations. I mean, what we need, as I've said many times, is what we did during the World War II emergency. The federal government took control of a quarter of the manufacturing capacity of the country to turn industry on a dime into what FDR called the arsenal of democracy, to arm the allies to defeat the fascists. And this we need to do just as much, if not more, to defeat climate change, which is why I call the Inflation Reduction Act Build Back Badly. You know, Biden did have a Build Back Better plan. Uh, originally, it proposed $2 trillion. Uh, the environmental movement, the climate movement, was demanding 10 bill, 10 trillion over 10 years. So he was uh, Biden was just proposing 20 percent of that. It was just 12 percent of uh, Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal, which was 16.3 trillion over 10 years. And Sanders had a serious proposal, included public ownership in key areas, uh, particularly power and actually agriculture. Uh, so that farmers could stay on the land, you know, public lands that uh, farmers could uh, farm on. Um, and as I said, it, you know, with this two trillion that uh, Biden proposed was just a half a percent of what we proposed in our Equal Social Green Deal. So what Biden got in the Inflation Reduction Act, 360 billion, was just 20 percent, even less, a little less than 20 percent of what he originally proposed in Build Back Better. And the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, the, the serious climate groups, Climate Justice Alliance, Center for Biological Diversity, Greenpeace, Food and Water Watch, Indigenous Environmental Network, and other people of color, uh, environmental justice groups opposed it, you know, because they don't want their communities like Cancer Alley in Louisiana, which is now going to get a lot of liquefied nitrogen gas, uh, liquefied natural gas um, facilities, export facilities in their region. They don't want to be sacrifice zones. And unfortunately, a lot of the mainstream climate groups around the big nonprofits, Sunrise, Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, Evergreen Action, as well as prominent climate you know, advocates, Bill McKibben and Michael Mann did support it, uh, as did a lot of the solar and industry trade groups because they wanted those incentives. Uh, but the, the bill didn't provide for uh, those jobs that are created by the incentives to be unionized, or at least to allow those groups to unionize. So it had a lot of problems. And as I pointed out before, Kate Aronoff, writing in The New Republic, uh, explained why these nonprofits decided to back this terrible bill. And that's because they need to tell their donors that they're making progress. Quote, Nonprofits, think tanks, and academics commenting on this proposed deal have millions of dollars in grants tied to being able to claim credit for something passing that they can feasibly call climate policy. But, you know, what we need to do is stop saying that defeats like the Inflation Reduction Act are victories. Um, and just to say more about it, this is U.S. policy now. It's a pro-fossil fuel bill. Uh, Bill Hartle at the Center for Biological Diversity called it a climate suicide pact. That's U.S. policy now. It requires the Interior Department to offer at least 2 million acres of public lands and 60 million acres of offshore waters for oil and gas leasing each year for a decade before they permit any utility scale renewable energy projects on public lands or waters. You know, we're talking about 600 million acres of offshore leasing over these 10 years, which is four times the size of the entire Gulf of Mexico's outer continental shelf. So the bill locks the government into permitting oil and gas leases for the next decade. So the International Energy Agency, the, the 
uh, conservative intergovernmental organization that was established by the OECD during the 1973-4 uh, energy crisis issued a report last May saying that if we're going to reach the goal of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, no new fossil fuel projects uh, can go forward from this point on. Yet here the U.S. is, is building more of them than any country in the world. Um, so it also claimed at the time that, uh, or supporters of it claimed it would reduce carbon reduction, it would reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. But if you look at the models that they were using, uh, and there were four of them, one from Rhodium, one from Princeton's Repeat Project, one from Energy Intervention, and one from Moody's, uh, they all assumed unrealistically that most of the carbon reduction or 40% or of the carbon reduction would come from carbon capture and sequestration. Um, so, wait, let me restate that. So they assumed that a fifth of the carbon reductions would come from carbon removal. Um, that's 13 times the current carbon removal capacity and they have to build that by 2030. And of the 12 current carbon capture facilities, all but one use the captured CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. What they want to do is pump it into oil wells to get more oil out of those wells. Um, and it would require 60,000 miles of carbon dioxide pipelines, which of course people on those proposed pipelines are resisting. And we've had some victories on that. Another problem is that the environmental justice money that's much touted, $60 billion, um, you know, the envir Indigenous Environmental Network really uh, went after that because they said these competitive grants will be taken by for-profit corporations and the big NGOs. It won't really get to the disadvantaged communities. And plus, this bill defined, quote unquote, clean energy to include carbon capture and sequestration, nuclear power, biofuels, fossil hydrogen, and carbon uh, markets using carbon offsets, which is a big scam. So that's the U.S. And, and I'll just conclude by pointing out, and we'll put a link to an article about this in the chat, uh, Uruguay, which is a middle-income country. Its GDP per capita is about one-third of what we have in the U.S., and three times that of low-income countries like El Salvador or Ukraine. And Uruguay has almost completely phased out fossil fuels and electricity production. Over the last 10 years, uh, they've got it to the point where in recent years, anywhere between 90 and 95 percent of all their power comes from renewables. And in, some, in one year, that was as high as 98 <clears> percent. <throat> and this was all built out over a decade. It built about 50 wind farms, uh, made their hydropower more efficient, and they've decarbonized their grid uh, almost 100%. Uh, and they provided a just transition for workers in the fossil fuel industry uh, by providing training in the renewable industry and created a net increase of 50,000 jobs. So Uruguay is showing us how to do it. And they are now turning to decarbonizing their transportation system and electrifying uh, the vehicle and rail transportation and, and ending the use of fossil fuels. So if Uruguay can do it, so can the US. And that it shows that the problem is not technological, it's political. And there's no excuse for the US leading the way and burning up the planet. And the Democrats have proven this Inflation Reduction Act is uh, exhibit number one, that they are not committed to a rapid clean energy transition. And of course, the Republicans just deny there's a problem. So that's why we need the Green Party to step up. So I'll stop there and uh, let's let's look at your questions and comments. Howie, are you going to have Christina for New Jersey on the show again? Uh, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. She, her election is next November, so we have time to do that. And, you know, it would be good to check in with her. So 
uh, I'll put that on the on the list of uh, things we should do. Scout Trooper 164. Biden is a complete joker when it comes to domestic policy, and RFK Jr. practically repeats Russian talking points. Ukraine is not a proxy war. It's a war Pudler runs to rebuild. To rebuild. I'm not sure what you meant by rebuild. Pudler is a term that uh, Ukrainians call Putin, kind of an amalgam of Putin and Hitler. Um, yeah, RFK is terrible on foreign policy. He repeats Russian talking points and Israeli talking points in support of settler colonialism and genocide. It's it's atrocious. And uh, I don't think he's going to stay as high as he's been in the polls as people find out what he really stands for. Aside from the, you know, the, you know, anti-vax stuff, um, his foreign policies are terrible. His position on the, on the border, he's as bad as Trump. You know, he's, he's demonizing immigrants, uh, you know, and he's he, he's moved hard to the right. And I think a lot of, you know, people who are mesmerized by the Kennedy name, which has a progressive aura, you know, when they find out what he really stands for, are going to uh, ditch him. So I, I expect he's going to he's going to fade fast as, as this goes on. to rebuild the Russian empire. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's where Putin sees his role in history. You know, he's gonna, and there's, there's lots of evidence of that in terms of him, you know, uh, valorizing uh, people who were prominent in the Russian empire, uh, bringing back actually white, uh, you know, the whites from the Russian revolution generals and bringing their remains back to Russia and creating memorials for them. Uh, he really does have an imperialist mentality. And uh, I think the other thing is he needs the war for domestic, quote unquote, tranquility. Uh, because without the war, you know, a lot of Russians are going to be asking, you know, uh, where's our economic security and where's our freedom? And uh, they don't get that under Putin. RFK and Jill are essentially the same anti-vax and Putin excusing candidate. Well, I wouldn't equate them. I, I am highly critical of Jill's position on Ukraine. You know, she does condemn the Russian invasion, but then immediately says that uh, Russia was provoked by NATO, which is like saying a wife beater was provoked by his wife and therefore he excuses him. Uh, there's no excuse. And on, on the Vax thing, uh, you know, Jill affirms that vaccinations are good. Um, she does criticize or question uh, the processes of the Center for Disease Control and the FDA. She's worried about corporate capture. Um, I think, you know, that's a concern. Um, I think she, she did an interview with Kim Iverson, who's kind of a conspiracy theorist, and I thought she was uh, pandering a bit to the anti-vaxxers, but she was clear. She's she's for vaccinations. So uh, very, very different than RFK Jr. So I wouldn't equate them, although I think, uh, you know, Jill can be criticized on Ukraine and uh, question on how she presents the uh, vaccination issue. She's appealing to anti-vaxxers on purpose. Um, well, I can't get into her head. I think one of the temptations of being a candidate is you, you want to please people. And she knew her audience, although personally, you know, she's a medical doctor. I think she understands how important, and she said how important vaccines have been for public health. So, uh, I, I, I would say it, it was more trying to, you know, please both sides than, than just appeal to the anti-vaxxers. But uh, you know, Jill should be should speak to that herself. By the way, let me just put in a plug for her. Despite my criticisms, I'm supporting her, and uh, 
the quarterly uh, period for contributions ends at midnight tomorrow. And the more contributions she has in that quarterly report, which we'll see on January 15th, uh, the better she'll be in terms of uh, convincing ourselves, but particularly the media, that she's a serious candidate. So today and tomorrow are good days to uh, give her a contribution for her campaign. Steve Welzer, we should support Ukraine by advising them to stop listening to NATO and the U.S. hegemon. It's getting Ukraine wrecked. Now, unfortunately, Ukraine will have to accept territorial losses. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. I think Ukraine, NATO and the U.S. should listen more to Ukraine. They've been slow in getting, for example, air defense systems to them. They, they, they stalled on the Patriot missiles, which are very effective. Now they have them. And They've been very effective in stopping Russian missiles. Um, it took them months and months to decide to give them tanks, to decide to give them uh, high Mars artillery, uh, to give them attack uh, to give them the F-16. So I don't think uh, NATO and the U.S. is telling Ukraine what to do. Ukraine is appealing for help, and they're getting it grudgingly, which is prolonged the war. And... Uh, uh, you know, Ukraine will have to accept territorial losses. You look at the polling of Ukrainians, and uh, there's a Kiev International Institute for Sociology, which has been polling on this question. Uh, is it time to uh, sue for peace and accept territorial losses or fight to get back all of Ukraine's territories? And uh, over 80% in the polls since May, there have been six of them, say uh, we have to keep fighting for our territories. And those who want to uh, accept territorial losses is in the single digits. So it's clear where the Ukrainian people are. And, uh, you know, look at what happened this week. You know, Russia spent enormous amount of money with those 158 missile and drone attacks. And they, they hit civilian targets, having no military impact. Meanwhile, Ukraine sent a cruise missile and destroyed uh, one of their landing ships which they can't use to land troops because Ukraine has basically made it impossible for the uh, Russian uh, naval force to operate in the Black Sea attacking Ukraine. They've had to move their ships to the other side of Crimea or over to Russia uh, from Sevastopol, which is on the west side of Crimea, closer to Ukraine. And, uh, you know, with that one missile, they, they blew up what it looks like was a, a ship filled with uh, munitions because it was a spectacular uh, explosion and completely destroyed that ship. So, you know, in that perspective, uh, you know, Ukraine won. And then as far as the front line goes, you know, Russia's now on the offensive and they're getting a few little kilometers here and there. It's basically frozen. But at one point, Russia had twice as much land as it now has. Uh, so in the long run, you know, Ukraine has been pushing Russia back. And you know, anybody that knows what's going to happen in a war is uh, being naive. Uh, you know, the Vietnamese were totally uh, outgunned. And in the Tet Offensive, they got clobbered. They really took a big a licking. But psychologically and politically, it had a big impact. It undermined support for the war around the world and particularly in the United States. So, uh, you know, fighting a war is as much politics as it is uh you know, munitions. And, uh, you know, if the world can support Ukraine in its resistance to Russian imperialism, they can win. I, I think, you know, one of Russia's talking points is it's hopeless Ukraine give up. Uh, but Ukrainians, they're not giving up. So I think, you know, as anti-imperialists, we need to support the Ukraine's, Ukrainians' resistance to Russian imperialism. Steve Welser, a wrong-headed faction in Ukraine has listened to NATO and the U.S. for a decade. Ukraine is losing. So who is the wrong-headed faction that's separate from another faction that doesn't want to listen to NATO? You know, the, the, you look at opinion polling in Ukraine and their attitude toward NATO before Russia's initial uh, in, instigation of the war in 2014, where they sent in troops, they took over Crimea and parts of uh, 
the Donbass, the Luhansk and, and Donetsk oblasts, um, the support for joining NATO was like, you know, 25, 30%. And then after Russia went into the Donbass and Crimea, it got to a little over 50%. And then in the most recent poll, again, from the uh, Kiev International Institute for Sociology, uh, they asked that question about joining NATO, and now it's 98%. Only 2% are opposed. And of course, the Ukrainians want NATO, uh, NATO to support them resisting Russian aggression. It's not surprising. I don't know who wasn't listening to NATO. I think there were a lot of people in Ukraine who uh, were skeptical of NATO and, and, and the West. And there still is. The left, you know, is saying we have a two-front fight here. It's against Russian tanks, but also Western banks, because they've, you know, got Ukraine in a debt trap like much of the global south. And they say Ukraine, which is a poor country, is the northernmost country of the global south. And therefore, you know, if people want to help Ukraine, we should be campaigning for debt cancellation by the IMF and by Western banks. And we've got some relief, mostly done by Europeans, including uh, Caroline Lucas, the Green MP in, in Britain, who really put the pressure on uh, the administration. You know how they do it in the in the parliament there, where the, the the prime minister has to answer to questions from the from the parliamentarians. And and Caroline Lucas was really giving it to uh, Boris Johnson at the time about these debts, and they did get a, a moratorium on the debts. They didn't cancel them, uh, but you know that was some progress. The U.S. Congress passed a bill uh, in late in, in about May or June 2022 asking the Treasury Department to use its influence to provide debt relief through the IMF and uh, other multilateral, multilateral financial institutions like the World Bank. And uh, the law provides for a report back by the end of this year. So that report will tell us what and if the Treasury Department did anything. Uh, I don't think they succeeded in getting any relief from the IMF because there's been no news on that. But what I'm saying is uh, fighting for debt cancellation for Ukraine is something that we can do to help, you know, the faction that wasn't listening to NATO is skeptical of NATO, it's the left in Ukraine. And, and they're saying we need arms to resist the uh, Russians, but we also need debt relief to resist the West. So I think... Uh, that may be the right-headed faction in, in, in Ukraine, and that's who we should support politically, the progressive movements, you know, the, the socialist in Solzioni Ruk, or call, it's called, so, it's Ukrainian for social movement, the solidarity collectives, which are more anarchist, the feminist groups, the environmental groups, the trade unions, they're all saying that. We need arms. The environmentalists are saying we need stronger oil sanctions on Russia, to stop funding its war machine. And they're all saying we need debt relief so we can you know, fund our social services, our war against Russian aggression, and then reconstruction. So um, that's those are the people in Ukraine that are skeptical of the West and we should be supporting. But you know, they're not saying surrender to Ukraine or give up territories. I mean, surrender to Russia and give up territories. John T. 4321, from a few sources I have listened to on YT, that Ukraine has already lost the war and is a matter of time when the world will know. I think you mean RT, unless there's something I don't know, YT. Yeah, that's the Russian talking point. Give up. You can't win. And uh, you too. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's around you too. It's... Uh, you know, it's it's a constant talking point from Russia. If you follow RT or uh, I'll, just, I'll butcher the name, Ria Novatsia, Tas, Sputnik, or their echo chamber, you know, among, you know, some bloggers and YouTubers and uh, other people, website owners on the, in the West. Yeah, that's what they say. Um, but that's that's to basically undermine political support in the West. So people say, well, it's useless. Why should we support Ukraine? Um, but as I pointed out, Ukraine is getting its blows in against Russia, like that ship they destroyed. 
And, you know, they're holding the line on the front line. They, they didn't breach it. Uh, but again, they were saying all the time until they started some efforts that they need air cover. You know, the idea that you can breach well-defended positions you know, that are dug in uh, <clears throat> without air cover, NATO itself would never attempt that. So, you know, the, I think the problem is the West is not giving enough support to Ukraine. John T. 43, 21. How will the Greens stop U.S. imperialism? Well, we need power. You know, the, the, the Democrats and Republicans aren't going to do it. So, you know, we, we build power. You know, we're doing that through the presidential campaign. Except for Ukraine, you know, Jill's good on U.S. imperialism. Um, and she's calling for, you know, deep cuts in military spending and putting that money into a global Green New Deal. So we you know, help the world transition to an ecologically sustainable and sufficient economy where people's basic needs are met. And that's how we, you know, build peace instead of war and make friends instead of enemies. Um, and I think that's an appeal that would be popular with the American people if we could get the platform. And the presidential campaign is one, but we need more candidates down ballot who raise these issues uh, where, you know, getting the mass media national coverage is not so crucial, where you can get local media, where you can meet people in campaign events and on the street. And, you know, that's local candidates for municipal and county office, it's state candidates for state legislature. And Congress is really a local race. It's a pretty large local race. You know, there's about 700,000 voters in each congressional district. But, it, you know, a well-organized campaign can really get the word out. Um, you know, I've been able to do that when I've run and so have many Greens. And that's really important to moving, you know, public opinion. But as I've said many times, until we get rid of this single member district winner take all election system and have ranked choice voting for executive offices and proportional ranked choice voting. So we have proportional representation in legislatures. We're up against the spoiler problem. And in the Trump era, it's become worse than ever. So many people who much prefer our program, and you look at public opinion polls, you know, the people are with us, not the Democrats. They want Medicare for all. They want student debt relief. They want a real Green New Deal. I mean, the polls show that. Um, and that's why the Democrats try so hard to keep us off the ballot. Um, but until we get rid of that spoiler problem, it's going to be there. And a lot of progressives are going to vote for the Democrats because they're rightly scared of the Republicans who aren't even for democracy anymore. They're neo-fascists, they're racist, and they really aren't interested in governing. They're interested in tearing down the place. They're really a destructive force. They're a right-wing nihilist. So, you know, to stop U.S. imperialism, we got to get power. And to get power, we got to change the electoral system, and we got to build from below. We got to have a lot more candidates from the green left running and uh, getting a base in office. There are 140 greens in office now. Uh, we won a little over half of the local races we ran last year. I mean, this is doable. And then we need to keep pushing. You know, there's a lot of uh, referendums. We have a 27th straight win record on uh, local referendums and state referendums for um, ranked choice voting. So, you know, I'm saying, it. you know, it's possible. I and mean, we just got to, you know, not get discouraged and keep pushing and expand what we're doing. We got to step up. Via email, comments on the Colorado and Maine rulings regarding Trump's ballot status. Well, as I read the 14th Amendment, it's pretty clear if you engage or encourage insurrection, uh, you're not qualified uh, to run for federal office. And uh, so I think, you know, Colorado and Maine made common sense rulings. Now it's gonna go to the Supreme Court. It's being decided in a number of states. I think there are 30 states where this is coming before either the courts or the Secretary of State, depending on the state and its rules. Like in, in Maine, it was the Secretary of State who has the authority to decide who 
should or should not be on the ballot based on the law. In Colorado, they had to go to the courts. Um, what was the other state where they uh, rejected the argument that Trump should be off the ballot? That ruling came down this week. I'm trying to remember which state it was. In any case, this is probably going to get to the Supreme Court very soon. And I'm not optimistic there. I mean, this court is more conservative than the court that appointed George W. Bush president and stopped the recount in Florida, which we knew a year later after the media went in and recounted all the ballots under every single criteria that uh, the uh, that Gore won the state of Florida. Um, but the Supreme Court, Michigan, right, that's the state where they rejected somebody's banging on my window. And I'm in the middle of a podcast, so I'll just try to ignore that. Um, so, yeah, that's my comment on, on the rulings. John T. 4321. Does anyone know that Article 5, the Amendment Clause of the Constitution, give the citizen the right to alter or abolish the government due to corruption and oppression? Uh, well, Article 5, I can't remember the details, but it gives several ways to amend the Constitution. Um, one is a, a national convention, I believe, constitutional, you know, constituent assembly kind of thing. One is it goes through the states. The amendment goes through the states after passing Congress. Um, but I'd have to look at the language. I don't remember the language alter or abolish the government. That sounds more like Jefferson um, in the Declaration of Independence. But in any case, we do have the right to amend. The problem is it's very difficult, more difficult than it should be. And probably the most difficult thing to amend is the U.S. Senate. There's a clause in the Constitution that says the uh, representation or the nature of the U.S. Senate can't be changed without the unanimous consent of the Senate itself. So if you wanted the Senate to be abolished and just have a single, you know, House of Representatives, or you wanted the Senate to be based on population rather than states, uh, you'd have to get unanimous consent from the from the Senate. So um, you would need a constitutional amendment then, which is a difficult process. Scout Trooper 164, Republicans bitch about the border, yet go on a vacation for three effing weeks. Sorry for my absence. I was busy and fell asleep during the last two weeks. Uh, don't worry, it's good to have you back. And uh, yeah, the the those guys in the Senate don't, aren't known for being, you know, real hard workers. There's a lot of junkets they go on, vacations they go on, and you're not getting anything done or very little. So, you know, again, I think the Senate, electing senators is hard in most states. In smaller states, you know, like Vermont, you know, the, the Senate district is the same as a congressional district. In small states, it's, it's a more reasonable campaign for a Green to run. But I think we should focus at the federal level on the House and, of course, the presidency, which gives us a national platform but especially at the state and local level. Let's build a base of electeds, which gives us credibility as we move up uh, to the federal level. <clears throat> Garrett Brown, it's, also, it's always about pushing the Palestinians out. Yeah, that's what we're getting from Israeli governments. And, uh, you know, as I've said, it's time for the U.S. to change its policy and, and you know, give the Israelis, I don't know what to call it, tough love and basically say, look, no more military aid. And in fact, we're going to start, you know, supporting BDS until you get into a serious negotiation with the Palestinians about the two-state solution that the international community and international law uh, says what should be the solution. Now, ideally, you know, you'd want to 
uh, unified secular uh, state for all the Palestinians and Israelis. But given the history, I think that's that's not in the cards at this time. I think what is in the cards is, you know, both Palestinians and Israelis, both national groups living in the same land, have their own state and uh, live side by side, uh, probably with some, you know, UN peacekeeping, uh, you know, monitoring and patrolling uh, the result. I think that's a realistic uh, outcome we can push for. And until the U.S., joins most of the rest of the international community, which really means the rest of the international community. Western Europe, some of those countries aren't so good. And then there's some island nations that are totally dependent on the U.S., so they vote with the U.S. on Israeli questions. But it's really the U.S. If the U.S. changes position, uh, the international community could put a hell of a lot of pressure on Israel, like it did on South Africa in the 80s. And Israel you know, would be in a real bind. They'd be totally isolated economically, diplomatically, militarily, uh, unless they, you know, got serious and, and, and negotiated with the Palestinians in good faith to find an acceptable two-state solution. Semi-sober-minded. Am I running again? I'm not running for president this year. I, you know, just didn't have the capacity to. My campaign team from 2020, their new children, new jobs, a couple of them passed away. Uh, you know, running a presidential campaign is like starting a, a business and you got to raise a lot of money. You got to find the right people. And it was just not in the cards for me this time. That's why I'm supporting Jill Stein, despite some differences with her. Um, I rule out nothing in the future, but this year um, I'm, I'm working on Ukraine solidarity for a ceasefire in Palestine on some local issues. Um, I'm writing articles here and there, and um, that's that's how I'm going to contribute at this point. Scout Trooper 164, Howie, how are you going to handle things before the new year? I'm planning on doing some house cleaning and selling stuff I don't use anymore. Just give some relief. Uh, there's not much time before the new year. I plan to finish reading the book I'm reading about left anti-Semitism by a guy in England, um, which is very interesting. And uh, I got to watch Syracuse basketball game today. There's some NFL games, so I'm going to Take some time out for that and then just keep on my, on my email. So I'm keeping up on the news and, and uh, you know, people ask me to do things. I, I you know, have been uh, responding to questions from Jill's team about the platform and about fundraising. So uh, I'll be busy till the new year, but I, I should clean my house and get rid of some stuff, but uh, not before the new year. Any close of 2023, looking into 2024 thoughts to close on. Okay, so you want to know what I think of 2023 and <coughs> what I'm looking for in 2024 um, to close on, which I guess means by the end of the podcast. Um, well, 2023 was really a rough year. Um for green socialists. Well, you know, 2023 is a, a good year to be getting done with, you know, what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Gaza, uh, the fact that Trump is still leading in the Republican primaries, that the legal process is moving so slow, there's still the possibility he could be elected president and pardon himself. And all this stuff he did will be postponed at least until for four years and most likely for good if he lives that long. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, good riddance of 2024, it was a tough year. 
uh, as far as it was for Green Socialists. I mean, the Green Socialist Organizing Project, we put out these podcasts. We do our organizing one-on-one podcasts. Um, we've produced a few articles, um, you know, and, and we're going to have a, for those that want to, you know, participate in the Green Socialist Organizing Project, look at our website at greensocialist.net, see what our principles of unity are. And uh, on January, is it 7th or 8th? Anyway, a week from Sunday, we're going to sort of do some strategic planning on what we ought to do for the coming year. And in the coming year, I think not just the Green Socialist Organizing Project uh, depends on how many people and resources we have, how we can contribute to this. But I hope there are a lot of, you know, people on the green left who are, you know, running or supporting people running for office and building their local green chapters. So we have the capacity not only to run for office, but to carry out issue campaigns and public education campaigns and internal education so that, you know, we're more informed and have a better analysis of how the world works and how we can change it. So I think those are the kinds of things that uh, green socialists need to be focused on in the coming year. And uh, the coming years, you know, is going to be wild. There it is on, on, uh, seven o'clock on January 7th. I mean, eight. Wait a minute, isn't it 7 p.m. on January, January 8th? Check that. I think that's what it is. It's, I think it's January 8th at seven. We normally meet at eight, but we're meeting at seven that Sunday. Um, so that's where we can, you know, talk through strategy for the coming year. And uh, January 7th at 7 p.m. Okay, I'm looking at my calendars. Why did I think it was the eighth? Yeah, it's got to be the seventh. Yes, January 7th, Sunday, January 7th at 7 p.m. And go to greensocialist.net if you want to be part of that conversation. So um, I I don't have a, you know, a, a worked out plan. I just know in general, you know, we need to build our locals and up our game in terms of candidates and issue advocacy and internal education and public education um, as just a general perspective. So that's that's about where I, I, I can that's about what I can say on that. Um, Looking at some of the questions. Yeah, I see John T4321 is considering Jill Stein due to the ballot access. Yeah. Um, I think that's one major thing that we can do with the Stein campaign. I think uh, we're in a better position than we've ever been in terms of early starts for petition drives. Uh, the Greens have finally learned that. So normally in a presidential year, we don't get really going until the spring. And then the deadlines start hitting us uh, too early. In a lot of states, you can you can start at any time or early in any case. And uh, that means now. And we've had uh, South Dakota, Arizona, Utah uh, gain ballot access in, in recent weeks. Is formal in Arizona and Utah. In South Dakota, they have enough signatures. I think they're still getting more before they submit. So they're in for sure. Uh, South Dakota, it would be the first time ever that the Green Party's been on the ballot in South Dakota. You know, Ralph Nader never got on. Jill Stein never got on. I didn't get on. Nobody's got on in South Dakota. But there's a, a group led by Lakota Indians who, uh, you know, started a Green Party there. I remember one of them interviewed me during my campaign, and he said, you know, if you ever start a Green Party in South Dakota, let me know. And, you know, I didn't have the capacity to go out there and do it, but he went ahead on his own with, with his uh, comrades. And so uh, they have a real good group. If you look at their uh, video, which you can, you know, search their website, it's a, it's a nice video about uh, introducing the South Dakota Green Party. And it's in English, but it has Lakota subtitles. Uh, so I think that's a, a positive and interesting development. So I think, you know, we're in a good shape to get on 
almost all the ballots. I think the toughest state is going to be New York. We got to get 45,000 good signatures in 42 days. It's the hardest petition in the country now. And uh, <clears throat> it's going to take a lot of money for paid petitioners to do that. And, you know, Kennedy will be doing that. Maybe no ballots will be, or what's it called? No ballots? What's that the other one? That corporate centrist group? Is it called no ballots? No labels. Thank you. No labels. I'm, I guess that was Freudian. I, I think they should be on no ballots because they uh, they aren't in anything new. They're just, you know, another corporate mainstream party. Um who hate the progressives and the Democratic Party and the Freedom Caucus and the Republican Party and uh, think that they can replace the, the, the more centrist uh, Democrats and Republicans, which I think is a pipe dream. In any case, it's going to be tough petitioning in New York. And, uh, but I think, you know, John T. is right that uh, one of the important things that Jill Stein's campaign will do is uh, – you know, get us on the ballot. And then in a lot of states, you get a certain vote for president or another statewide office. You get a ballot line for the next election cycle, which makes it much easier in most states for people down ballot to run for local and state races. So there's, that's, that's a, you know, a, a good outcome we can get out of this election. And uh, given how much people hate Biden and Trump, their approval ratings are even lower than Trump and Clinton in, in 2016, it might be a good year to you know, get a, a, a bigger green vote than we've got recently. Um, and that will be an advance for us. Uh, but in any case, it will keep our issues like the Green New Deal and you know, universal public health care, Medicare for all, you know, on the agenda and give people who want to vote for that a way to vote for it. You know, one of the things that came out of the 2016 exit poll, the only time this question's ever been asked that I'm aware of, is they asked people who voted for Jill Stein and also Gary Johnson, the Libertarian, well, if they weren't on the ballot, who would you vote for? And 61% of Jill's voters said they would have stayed home. They wouldn't have voted for either Clinton or Trump. I think 25% would have gone for Clinton and 14% for Trump. You plug those numbers into the close states in 2016, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, where the Democrats claim Jill Stein spoiled the election. You plug those numbers in, and Trump still would have won those states. So, you know, to call her a spoiler technically is probably not true. But as I pointed out earlier, the spoiler question is inevitably going to come up as long as we have, you know, winner take all, plurality winner of presidential elections. We got to fight for ranked choice voting. And one of the problems with the Democratic Party, including the progressives, is there is no bill in Congress for that. It's just, it just astonishes me. Where are the progressives on this? There is a bill for a pot national popular vote. Um, and it's worse than the, the bill that almost passed uh, the Congress in 1969. It passed the House and it was defeated in the Senate by two damn Dixiecrat votes. Birch Bayh was the uh, spearhead for that. Richard Nixon supported it. Would have got rid of the Electoral College. You'd had a national popular vote for president. And if nobody got over 40%, uh, you'd have a runoff between the top two vote getters, which is you know, kind of like ranked choice voting, which is really instant runoff voting, which is what we should have. So you know, where are the damn progressives? They're, they're asleep at the wheel. We had a good bill from John Conyers, introduced it in 1989. I think he carried it until 1999. Uh, for fair ballot access, federal standards. It, it provided for a common period for petitioning from 270 to 60 days before the election. So that's, you know, 210 days to petition, which is seven months, which is, you know, a lot more reasonable than New York, 42 days. Um, and let's see if I can remember... Uh, the petition, uh, the maximum petition for a federal office is a thousand signatures. And the other uh, criterion was 0.1% of the votes in that race. So, you know, for to get a, uh, a, 
a presidential candidate or a statewide, you know, candidate for governor or whatever, would have been a thousand signatures maximum, which is much lower than most states now. And if you apply that 0.1% standard to uh, congressional races, there are about 350,000 votes per congressional district in 2020. So 0.1% uh, of that uh, would be about a petition instead of a thousand signatures it would be about 350 signatures. So, you know, that's very reasonable. It's still a lot more than the other countries. I mean, you want to get on a ballot, uh, you want to run for the parliament in England, it's 10 signatures. Uh, in Canada, it's 50 in the rural districts and 100 in the urban districts. In uh, Australia, I think it's one of those, it's two signatures. I can't remember if it's New Zealand or Australia. I mean, we're just off the charts in this country in ballot exclusion. So the Conyers bill, uh, and then to get a ballot line for the next election cycle, it would be 20,000 votes statewide. Uh, and any statewide office would count, Secretary of State, Governor, President, uh, which if that was the standard now, Greens would have ballots lines in, in most of the states. And it was 20,000 votes or 0.1% of that vote, which you know in small states would be less than 20,000. About half the states would be less than 20,000. So anyway, where are the damn progressives in the Democratic Party? Where's the fair ballot access bill? Where's the replace the Electoral College with a national ranked choice popular vote for president. There is a bill for proportional ranked choice voting for the House and ranked choice voting for Senate seats. It's called the Fair Representation Act. Uh, it's actually a centrist Democrat in Virginia. He actually belongs to the centrist uh, New Democrat Coalition as well as the Progressive Caucus, which a lot of them aren't that progressive. But in any case, it's only got seven co-sponsors. Um, it's pathetic. And uh, that's why we need Greens running in these races, uh, including against, you know, the progressives until they start introducing this kind of legislation and really pushing it. So anyway, in 2024, I hope that uh, we can raise these issues in the elections and in the streets. And I guess we're, we're over time and it's time to conclude. So I'll I'll stop there and uh, I will see you next year, which is next Saturday at the same time. So have a good week.